Oh, am I being recorded? Yeah. Oh, I'm, oh, too bad. I was going to say something. Well, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to say, and no, no offense to anybody, but um, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're a software architect who was never programmed, right, is, is kind of like a priest at a wedding. He, he does, you know, he, he, he performs the service, but he can only imagine what comes after. If you're, if you're an architect and you don't know how to program, your design will reflect the fact that it may be very difficult to, to implement. So there's that. A lot of the, the best software architects are coming up from, from programming. That's recorded? Wonderful. Um, okay, we have about two minutes. Any, uh, any, any questions or, or anything to... Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Okay, yeah, all right. So I, um, I have a, uh, I'm kind of retired from my day job. Uh, I was, at the end, uh, toward the end, I was, um, I was with Sun for 20 years. Uh, I was with them uh, when they were a startup, a start down, and a start writing your resume. Uh, the, the, the startup period was the most fun, for sure. Uh, I was technical, I wound up eventually as technical director of, of, of the company, and, and I supported I did an awful lot of work, and that's how this thing started, an awful lot of work with standards bodies in specific industries, like how do retail, all the systems that go on in a retail enterprise, you really want to be doing plug and play, which means you want to have interfaces for the, you know, the point of sale system and the item inventory, and, and working out those so that uh, vendors would, would do these APIs uh, uh, and so you could plug and play, and, and actually it turned out it was more plug and pray. But I was doing that in a lot of different industries and looking at how software architects uh, sitting on those committees and realizing that a lot of what they were doing in different industries, although they didn't know about it, was a lot the same. Uh, so that's kind of where this came from. I actually started uh, object-oriented analysis and design at the ANZA because they had introduced some object languages, and I said to a student, how did you, what, how did you find it? And, and the answer was, oh, it's great. C++ is great. I, slash slash is a comment. You know, and it's like, no, you're not using the language. <laughs> so anyway, that, that started this, and, and, uh, and here I am. Yes? So you know, tying together your comments about you know, architects really should have some basis in programming. Yes. Um, even though this isn't a programming class, do you show examples? And it's Absolutely. What languages? Absolutely. And we'll, we'll, we'll show an example here. Yeah. One, one slide on here is the complete evolution of computer languages. So, uh, like I said, it's a lot of... But because they're of, they evolved in a certain way, and when you look at the series of languages, you start seeing what drove the evolution of languages, and it's... It, we'll look. So I think, uh, uh, are we good? We, we start? Okay, so the, the priest thing is down on tape. Okay, um, so here we go. How to think like a, like a software architect. Now, this goes back to 2015, which is admittedly uh, uh, the dark ages uh, uh, in computer science, but uh, CNN Money magazine, and I, was, I love this, it was the number one best job in the United States was software architect. And the analysis to understand what it is, you think about uh, the way that an architect designs a house, a software architect lays out plans uh, for new programs. Uh, an architect uses blueprints, a software architect may use UML, which is Unified Media Language Diagrams. Um, there's a lot of them. Uh, the ones that really matter are the ones that don't document what you thought, but actually help you think about the, the problem. And we'll look at a few of those. Um, you know, uh, new problems come up all the time, and new technologies arise, making each day different and keeping professionals in demand. And, and, and that is true. One other thing, what we're going to talk about are the kinds of applications that are ubiquitous everywhere but in the valley. Because in the valley, it's all about eyeball capture and customer capture and front end and this and that. The systems that we're going to talk about being architectured in an object-oriented fashion are the back office stuff. Most of the programming jobs in this country are working as in the IT department of a major corporation. Now, that corporation is located in Kansas City or, you know, Minneapolis, and you don't see it here. 
or working for companies that sell to major companies, not customer-facing companies. And, and the, the, the systems that we're going to be talking about are the way the world works. Every company, every school has a plethora of uh, programs that interoperate and, and are designed in the way that we're going we're gonna to talk about. And it's one of, if you're in, everybody knows this, but people in the valley. So let's, let's take a look. If you're building a house, um, or you're building anything, really, there's a customer planning documents, some physical design decisions, uh, and, um, and then the actual installation. And if it's a house, you have a buyer, and you have an architect who does the blueprints. You have a general contractor who makes decisions like, what type of plumbing are we going to use? Probably better to use copper than lead, right? Uh, what kind of wiring are we going to do? What kind of plug-in are we going to have for the speaker? Uh, and then you have the skilled workers come in and they do the electricity and the, the installation of the actual wiring and the plumbing and they make it real. And in a software application, this parallels the development of a software application. The buyer is the domain expert. So if you're in retail, the buyer uh, of that particular system might be the, you know, the head, uh, head retail data person. If it's in a college, and the example we're going to do is from a college, uh, it might be the registrar. Uh, someone who knows the application, doesn't know the programming. The software architect functions um, uh, as the architect does in a house. The blueprints are these UML artifacts, and we'll see two of them uh, before of the big five. We'll get a chance to see two of them. General contracting, that's the aspect of any application. It's the thing that says, you've got your application right. How did you do security? Is your data going to be local in the cloud? Is your application going to be in the cloud or in the data center? Those are major decisions that you, that you have to make. Uh, uh, and the people who do that are sometimes a software architect, sometimes it's like the designer. And then when it's, everything's laid out, programmers come in and, and, and implement it. Now, sometimes, admittedly, the programmer can be wearing a lot of hats. You can, you know, if you're on a small project, you do most of that yourself. But for large projects, they really are uh, uh, different. But what does a software architect actually do when developing a new application? So the first thing is read, understand, and clarify the functional spec. Um, this is typically a one-on-one -on -one interaction with the domain expert. What is the system trying to do? to identify and document the problem, the requirements, the constraints, and so on. Now, the next slide is an example. This was an enrollment system at the Anza College. Um, uh, my thinking here is, when I presented this, that I knew that everybody in the audience had actually used a system like that, because otherwise they wouldn't actually be sitting in the room. Uh, people here, I'm sure, have enrolled in courses at, at different schools. And so we're going to take a look at what's involved with something like that and how you think about it. So, uh, I'm, uh, again, uh, this is a very quick read, and um, I'm just going to spend a uh, highlight it. The ends of courses are offered by its departments and available quarterly. Each course has an identifying number, a name. This is, um, ob in my case, object-oriented analysis and design, a description, number of credits, optional set of prereqs. Each course is assigned a set of times when it meets, assigned a teacher, qualified and willing, uh, you can be willing, but you may not be qualified, and who is free during the assigned times. It's assigned a room, which also must be free. Students may then attempt to enroll, and then there's some requirements on that, and depending upon the size of the course, the number of students, the student's enrollment request may either be accepted or the student may be waitlisted or the request may be denied. If the student is accepted, her attendance will be tracked, and at the end of the academic quarter, she will receive a final grade. This is a very high level and brief functional description of uh, a combination of class scheduling and enrollment. It's a system. You must produce a working solution. Where do you begin? This is the wrong answer. You don't start coding. In fact, everything between what I, I give an entire course on what occurs between the functional spec and this. Okay, it's the, the thinking about the problem that's really the, the interesting thing. So th this is a diagram for how systems are developed using 
feature-driven design. And we, are, we start out with the functional specification. This is the piece we're going to get to today, uh, uh, going through and thinking about what are the basic abstractions in the problem and how do they interact, inter interact and how do, they, how do they relate together. When you have uh, uh, the, the basic abstractions, you then flesh out the behavior. Remember I said that the section, you could, you, you could know every interface to a, se uh, um, to a, I'm sorry, a course. You could know every interface to a course object, um, but you wouldn't know, if you said I want to enroll, you wouldn't know whether, what the reaction was going to be, because the course could be filled or the course could be empty. Or the, you know, so some cases you'd be rejected, other cases you'd be put on a wait list. That's behavior and behavior is stateful information. So once you get your objects and they're stateful, then the various use cases like enroll student in section are taken and analyzed against the, the objects that you have to make sure that you can, you can do the application as defined. So we're gonna, we're gonna concentrate on the first part to give you an idea of the thinking that goes into uh, a typical application. So again, number one, identify the basic abstractions referred to in the functional spec. And in the functional spec we looked at, there were some words that must be further refined to determine exactly what the proposed system is actually required to do. So we do that. We go, the ends of college. College sounds like a thing I'm going to be manipulating, right? Courses, courses are offered by its departments. So I'm thinking, okay, I've got colleges, I've got courses, I've got departments. How hard is this, right? Um, uh, uh, let's see, do, do, do. It is also assigned a teacher, okay, who is both qualified and willing. It is also assigned a room, students. And I look at this and I'm saying, okay, I, I kind of have at least conceptually some of the abstractions that I'm going to be dealing with. Course, college, teacher, department, room, and section. And I start out and I say, okay, so far so good, right? And then I start thinking about it because one of the things that's true when you are designing a system is that words have meaning. And everybody on that system design, whether it's the architect, the designers, the programmers, the customer, everybody has to have a very clear and crisp definition for what the names that you're assigning these abstractions, what they, they, they fully mean in the context of the application. Because the same word can mean totally different things in different applications. Um, you know, the, the one example I give is a, a birth record system, where one of the things, there's an attribute that's like blood type, and that attribute is like a string, it's OH positive, whatever. If that application is a blood bank, blood type is this huge object with all of the capabilities, same word, but in a different application, it means something totally different. So here, I start asking questions. Can a room and a teacher be assigned to a course? In other words, how many people have enrolled in a course at a college? How many people? That's it? Yeah, okay, good, good, thank you. Uh, one of the things I find in, in my classes, um, like I'll do exactly that, I'll say how many people have, in, have enrolled in this course? And in a class of 40 people, I'll get 15 hands. <laughs> and, and, I'll re and then I say, and how many haven't? And then I get no hands. And I got 15 votes out of 40 people, and I always tell them, that's why we have the president we do. Okay. Um, <laughs> but, but anyway, thank you. I, that's on the tape, too, of course. Um, so, so the question is, um, how can, you know, can a room teacher be assigned to a course? And you, you think about it, and then, you know, you go, well, that's tough, right? Because, you know, you've got a, a, a course, and like um, uh, Introduction to Python. And, it, you know, it's given it four times during the, the week uh, in four different rooms with four different teachers. How can they all be assigned to that course? It's not, you know, it's just... It's a little strange, you know, because a course might be taught in several rooms. A course might be taught in, by several teachers. If you enroll in a course, which teacher are you getting and which room are you getting? And you start to think, 
you know, I'm missing something here. It's that uneasy feeling that you get when you, you realize that, that your vision of the problem doesn't really match up with the actual reality, reality on the ground. So we need a new abstraction. There has to be, there's a, an object or an abstraction that's missing from the initial set of objects that we, that we had. And we need a section. And a section has a room, teachers, students, hours to meet. Um, a course has the rest of it. Has description, name, credits, the textbook that you might have. What, you know, again, what quarter is it offered? Um, and there's a relationship between the two. And it's a one-to-end relationship. And that is, a course has multiple sections. And a section, each section is a section of one course. So you've got an end-to-one relationship between course and section. And the relationship is instantiates. In the same way that an, that an object will instantiate a class. So if you have a class scientist, uh, an object of that class is Albert Einstein or Isaac Newton. It instantiates the concept. An object instantiates a, a class. In the same way, you know, uh, uh, conceptually at least, a section instantiates a course. It's the relationship. Now again, one of the things you could say is, well, you know, you could carry, what do you even need a course? You could carry all this information in each section. Every section could have the name of the course and the textbook and, you know, but then if you have five sections of one course, you've repeated the information five times. It's much better to keep the abstractions separate and relate them through an instantiate relationship. Refining the abstractions. So now we've got a problem here uh, when we start thinking about it more. We've got sections now, right? Um, and the question now is how does, do teachers rooms and students detect scheduling conflicts when assigned a new section. Because one of the requirements is obviously you can't attend two sections that overlap, you can't teach two sections that overlap, and you can't host in a given room two sections that overlap. So there's obviously going to have to be some scheduling stuff you're going to have to do, and you're going to have to do it uh, for teachers, rooms, and students. And so you're looking at this and you're saying, you know, the same logic is going to be presented three times. I'm going to have to write the same logic three times to be able to schedule teachers, rooms, and students. You have duplicate functionality in, in three objects. And that seems wrong. And at that point, you think, or you should think if you're a software architect, duplicate functionality in three separate objects. This is a design challenge. I cannot possibly be the first person to encounter this problem. And you're not. There's a thing, and, and, and I'll ask for a show of hands, seriously voting. How many people have heard of design patterns? Oh, fantastic. <laughs> That's fantastic. OK, design patterns for the two people that didn't raise their hand, uh, design patterns are kind of like object libraries. It gives you a chance, instead of reusing code, it gives you a chance to reuse thinking. And so um, a design pattern here is um, each assigned their own schedule. When in doubt, when you've got, and you can refactor, when, you're, when you have the same logic that's being repeated again and again, what you realize or what you could do is to incorporate all of that in an object, one object, and then have everybody else use it. This doesn't sound like a great step forward, but schedule is a particularly good example of this because with schedule, um, you don't even have to know how to, how to write that. You don't have to know how it was set up. You, the only thing the schedule object does from externally, right, is you could say, here's a schedule for the section. Here's my schedule. Is there a problem? And the schedule comes back. Your schedule object comes back and says, Nope or yep. And, and if, if there's no, you could say to your schedule object, please add this schedule, and it does. You have no idea how that was done. The person who implemented schedule has the idea how that was done. That's why they're objects. The thing about objects is they encapsulate their, 
their implementation. So we started with these six, and now we've got two more. We, we said, you know, in terms of the abstractions in the enrollment system, um, we've just added schedule, which is going to save us a lot of problems in, in, in figuring out how, uh, how to make sure that both teachers, rooms, uh, and, and students uh, don't have schedule conflicts. And we have a section which is distinct from what we thought was a course. Um, and we're starting now. That's been the morning staring at the ceiling. Okay, what's a prereq? Prerequisite means it's a requirement, you know, right? So we look and we say, well, you know, a prereq, it's a course. It has a course identifier, right? Like, you can't take CS28 until you took CS3. And so, so the prereq is CS3. Probably the prereq is a course. Um, prereqs might have other prereqs. Cool. Uh, CS3 might have CS1 as a prereq and so on. So it's, it's going to be... Um, uh, of course. Uh, no, it's not, right? Um, because the, if you look at most catalogs, prerequisites are either courses or, and the, they could be advisory and mandatory. You've got to have this or you maybe need this. It would be good if you had it. Uh, and in fact, they can be text strings. You can either have this course or you can have some prior experience with an object-oriented language. So what a Prereq is when, when you think about it in this particular application, thinking about the application and how it's going to get solved. Um, a prereq is, is probably an object optionally containing a course ID among other elements. So we're now at nine. Just in terms, whoops, sorry. Just in terms of thinking about the, um, the, uh, the enrollment and the uh, fleshing out and creating uh, sections, we've now got nine. Uh, objects that we that we thought about, uh, and the um, so the second piece of this determine the relationships between the abstractions often involves selecting and incorporating design patterns. The this URL it's a marvelous URL. Nobody in my class is on, but I, I get the feeling here people have how many people n know that have heard of the Gang of Four. Okay, how many people think that was China right after Mao. No, okay, okay. There's a second gang of four, okay? It's the gang of four who wrote the book on object-oriented, uh, well, actually, actually on design patterns, who took the collection of designer successes and found a formal, formalistic way to, to define them so that they can be reused easily. Now, the book, the gang of four book, uh, was a landmark, and uh, um, uh, you don't have to know the contents, but you really want to know the index because the index tells you what's there. And if you need it, you know, you're going, oh, man, I've, you know, I've got all of this code reduplicated, and you look, and there's the pattern that says, why don't you put it, refactor, and get a separate object and put the code in there and so on. So um, this is free on the web. It's a PDF file now. Uh, it's really cool. Um, and, uh, and I would urge, uh, uh, you know, if you're serious about programming, uh, this is the original one. There's now a lot more because every grad student wants to get his own pattern, you know, her pattern. Um, but this is the original. These were the ones that were felt to be important. If, again, if, if you're doing something specific like, you know, the cloud or something, there's books on cloud patterns and so on, which are going to help you think about, reuse the thinking of those that, that come before. It's, it's very much like in science, they always say, you know, I stand on the shoulders of the generations that have, that have gone before. And in programming, it's more like you stand on the feet of the generations that have gone before, and you're always, you don't get up very high, and you're always tripping and falling over each other. But design patterns are supposed to be uh, the way that you, uh, you really do reuse the thinking of, 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 of others. So this is a, a diagram. It's the conceptual class diagram. It is a UML diagram. And if you're starting an application, in fact, if you're coming into a company that has an application, um, this is the thing you want to look at. Yes? This? It, it, it probably does. Uh, you know, the people that put together the unified modeling language were using the work of the people that had come before them. 
this, uh, but in, in this particular diagram, uh, if I was starting work at the company that was uh, making enrollment systems and so on, um, this tells me what kind of what I'm dealing with. Um, one college has n departments. Each department employs n teachers. Teacher tends to be employed more for the department than the, than the college. Um, each department owns rooms. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes the rooms are owned by the college. But in our particular case, we're going to find out that that's true. Um, each department offers courses. Uh, courses may have prereqs. Uh, each course is instantiated by n sections. And notice section room and teacher incorporate schedules. And if you look at this, it, it's an overview, and a teacher ins one teacher instructs multiple sections. Now, you could say, well, maybe it's team teaching and stuff, and there's a little bit of arm waving here. But in general, if you're trying to get your mind around what it is that the application is doing and what are the basic abstractions that are going to be manipulated, this is not a bad, not a bad diagram. <laughs> Well, we don't here, uh, uh, you know, and this is this is where this is the, the the high level conceptual, and and now again, where it gets interesting, right, is let's say that we are all this this is a, a company meeting, of the enrollment, you know, we are enrollment company, right, and we sell these things, and and your your point is well taken. We we sold it into three colleges, and now the fourth college says, well, wait a minute, we allocate rooms to multiple departments and how is that going to work and we have to think about that 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 yeah stuff moves right it's not th this is just in our in our simple case because we could clearly spend a day refining this with all of the things but conceptually this is at least the first pass if you came in then at least you now because look at what you did you looked up here and you said I don't think that fully reflects a requirement I have but at least we've all got the same thing to shoot for. We're all talking about the same, uh, you know, description of what the of what the problem is. So, so the question was for the people that couldn't pick that up on the on the uh, on the video thing. The question was: It makes sense to the domain expert. You can show this to the registrar, and he or she can look at this and say. Yeah, that's right. And if, in fact, you said something like, well, you know, um, we have some, some uh, uh, sections that are virtual, okay? And you're now, so you're looking and saying, great, we're going to have a virtual room that's always free. And, you know, and, and the point is you can, you can take the requirement that the registrar has said and you can map that into the particular object or objects that are going to be affected by trying to meet that requirement because you're thinking about the problem in the same way that the domain expert is thinking about the problem. That's the key thing. It's why if an architect for a house, you know, if, if, the, uh, uh, you know if, if, the, if the user says, you know, and I want an aquarium in the bathroom, well, you kind of know where the bathroom is, and you kind of know where an aquarium is, and you mumble, 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 and now you start. But the point is, that's kind of what this is. And requirements change. Right? There, there, there's a, one of my favorite cartoons, which I had hanging over my desk for a couple of years, was it was a, a, there was, it's ancient Egypt, and there's a pyramid, and it's not quite filled. It's, it's huge in the distance, but the top is still not quite done, and there's lines of men in the distance heading toward that pyramid and going up the sides to fill it in, you know, building this huge pyramid. To, and there's a, a gentleman on, standing on a hill overlooking all of this, and he's got a megaphone, and he's screaming into the megaphone, stop work, there's been a small change of spec, the pharaoh wants to be cremated. Okay, now, now the, the, <laughs> that's, that's an example of a rather a larger change of spec than we normally see on these things, but your, your point was, was valid. Well, you know, what if you had virtual sections? What if you had rooms that are shared? What if you had, and you're trying to expand your, your, your application, but conceptually at the top layer, this is what you're, what you're seeing. Yes? Can you go back to the yes, I can. Diagram. Uh, I was just commenting on the, the arrow uh, between course and section. Is that the correct uh, direction? So the arrows, uh, Typically, the way the arrows work is the arrows 
uh, uh, indicate how the word applies. So one room locates n sections, right? But here, n sections instantiates one course. Had I said instantiate by, the arrow would have been the other way. Like one course is instantiated by n sections. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So, relationships. If a relationship, and these are some C++ coding examples, but they're very small, it, it's not necessarily that you need to know how to write C++ code, but you should know how to read a couple of lines. Um, so this is a, a class teacher, and inside of class teacher is a private schedule object. That's a one-to-one -one relationship. Every teacher has a schedule. Um, one to N, like every teacher can teach many sections, but a section only has one teacher. So in this particular and simple case, uh, you have a teacher and uh, it has, teacher, every teacher has an array of, this is really bad code, has um, uh, an array of up to 20 sections. Well, and basically has an array of up to 20 section pointers because the teacher object isn't going to contain the sections. It's going to point to 20 sections that the teacher might teach. One teacher and sections, uh, uh, what you're really saying is a teacher has a collection class uh, of sections. And the collection class, and it depends, and if you're the architect, you'll specify, right? There's the vector, which is everything that an array always wanted to be when it grew up. Um, you know, there's hash tables, there's a link, a link lists, there's uh, queues and stacks, and these are all ways that one thing can collect other things. And uh, the architect will determine, and there's, if, you know, if we had another hour, we'd talk about the appropriate use of collection classes. But this is one to n. Right, and to one is, um, in this particular case, every teacher and teachers point to a department. So if the department name changes, and, and that at the end may be happening, we may be going from CIS, finally, to CS, from computer information systems to computer science. Um, if we did that, uh, it's not like every teacher would have to, every teacher would see that immediately because Teacher points to department and department names change. So if you ask the teacher, what department are you? You change the name of the department and you don't have to run around in all the teacher objects and change the name because you just end things are pointing to the same thing. And, and that's an example of end to one. End to end. This is the bad one. A student may be enrolled in many sections and every section can have many students. So if, if you're a student, you're enrolled in five sections, one to end. If you're a section, you have 40 students, that's end to end. That's called the uh-oh uh, interrelationship. And here we are. You have a student, and it's got a schedule, and you've got a section that's got a schedule. Uh, it's an end to end relationship. One student, and sections. Every section has n students. How do we implement this? Well, the first thought is, why not, why not, um, why not have arrays of pointers, just like we did before? So you're a student, you point to all of the sections that you think, and if you're a section, you point to all the students that are enrolled, and if you're a programmer, you're done. And if you're an architect, you're not done because you're thinking about it, right? And you're saying, well, wait a minute. You solve the problem for interrelating end to end, but this problem is a little different because each relationship has its own data. So if you're a student in a section, you have a final grade that's assigned. You have an attendance records. You have exam grades. You have teachers' comments. You know, works and plays well with others, I don't know. But the point is all of that goes along with your relationship to the section. Now the arrays, where do you carry this information? If, do I carry it in student? Do I carry it in section for each one of these? For each, each student in a section, I have this. Or for each section that the students take, I have that. Or worst of all, do I have it in both places, right? And you're thinking, I have an end-to-end -end relationship with associated data. What am I going to do? I'm probably the first person in the world that ever ran into this. <laughs> and you slowly think, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute there's probably a design pattern. So you go to the gang of four, 
or whatever you're, you're using for your thing, and you say, ah, a junction class. Put something in the middle. So, you know, now every student has N of these things, and every section has N of these things, and this thing, whatever, the, whatever it is, has a pointer to the student and a pointer to the section because it's an N to one relationship with both of them, and it has the associated data of the relationship. So one student can walk through these things and find out everything for every section it's in, it now can find out, okay, I can get the section to find out the section information, and I can also find out how I did in that section. And every section uh, says, okay, for all the students that I've got, I can come in here and find out what their grades were, and I can get the name of the student. And we solve it. The question is, what is a thing? Let's talk about that. So someone said it's the enrollment. But the problem is enrollment works for the section. And in fact, enrollment is probably the name of the collection of these things. You know, if you have 40 students enrolled, right, each one of these, it's an enrollment. But the, yeah, I mean, it is. But typically enrollment is, all, is the collection of, I mean, it's not bad, but it's the collection of all of the students in a section is usually what enrollment is. So a data table, the meta table. So you, you could say every student has n meta tables. You know, I mean, it, you could, right? But it may, that may be how it's implemented, and particularly, are you a database guy? Okay, that was a lucky guess on my part, because meta tables typically, I mean, that's, there is a different thinking between database people and, and, and object-oriented designers. Uh, because the databases, you know, they're, they're into junction. They know, junction, but anyway, they're different, and, and sometimes you, you, you trip over it. But that, I mean, because metada metadata, in a way, it may apply, it may not apply, but that's not the name of it. We'll, we'll, you're looking here for the thing that binds, yes? I was going to call it grade, but we are using We use the word grade, and a grade is just a part of this. A what? It is. It is, and, and, and yeah, right, and... and if you're an architect, there are people who say guys don't understand relationships. Well, if you're a, if you're a, if you're a, if you're a, a software architect, yes, you do. You know, um, but but yeah, but I mean that wouldn't help. It's like because what are you going to say? You're going to say to the uh, domain uh, to to the registrar, every one of your students is involved in many relationships. You know, it's not it's not what you want. You you, you want to say something to the to the registrar that's going to you know he or she is going to go yeah okay I get that what binds you to every section you ever, you ever sat in? Hint. Dollars. It's a seat. If you, if you, a student occupies N seats, and a section has N seats that gets occupied by student, and every seat says, this is the student, that's the section, that's the final grade that you got in that seat. That, uh, uh, I mean, the point is, I guess the point here is, you had the junction set right, but it's if you can find a name that absolutely nails what this abstraction is, you're way ahead of the curve. Because this is something that the domain expert, will, uh, like the registrar, will understand immediately. Yeah, we open up a section with 40 seats, um, uh, uh, 27 of them are allocated to students. So you, you've got the 40 seats, but only 27 of them have a reference to show that there's actually a student there. And again, seat is a very useful uh, abstraction. Uh, an example would, might be, well, you know, kind of you think of it like, well, an airline, right? An airline seat. An airline seat is very different than this kind of seat because an airline seat has an identity. You walk into a room to sit down, you're just going to sit down in any room. But that's not true on a plane, uh, unless you're flying southwest. Um, the, uh, but, so that's a, that's a, a, a difference. Uh, the other difference is, you know, um, how many of you are in a first class seat here? You know, you know. So the same name, the same seat name, and in fact, but it, a very different abstraction. We need to define what a seat is. And once we do that, a lot of the problems we had go away. We used the design pattern, and we've now got a new abstraction. Um, and so, guess what? We're now up to 10. We, we originally had six. We've thought about how we're uh, developing things, and um, we're, up to, we're up to 10. And so, now we go back to the functional description, 
and we put in our abstractions, and we go back to, to the registrar and we say, this is what we're solving. In the ANSA College, courses are offered by departments, uh, et cetera, prereqs. Each offered course is instantiated by one or more sections. Each section is assigned, right? And it has a schedule, which defines a set of times. It is also assigned a teacher, and so on and so on. It is also assigned a room. Students may then attempt to enroll in a section if they are paid up, and so on and so on. Uh, depending upon the number of students, uh, may be accepted, the student may be waitlisted, or it may be denied. If the student is accepted, she will be assigned a seat. This is the same description, except this is now a description that we can implement, because we have an idea of what the abstractions mean in terms of the application that we're trying to solve. It's, it's the, the first step, because typically you get a functional spec and you're going, I don't understand it. I don't understand what this means. I don't understand what that means. So the first step is at least getting the functional specification defined using words that you understand how to build and use in solving the application. Yes, sir? Don't you also need the notion of a quarter? Um, yeah, maybe. Uh, uh, I mean, a, a quarter is, is an... I, my first thought would be to say a quarter is an enumerated variable that has, you know, four values, summer, winter, spring, and fall, and I'm not sure what else it, it has with it, at least as far as enrollment goes. So for example, it has a list of courses that are offered in that quarter, and you, for a student, it's the list Yeah, of yeah you, you could have that, um, and, and that might be a, a, a division. The other, or you might just say, I don't need that because um, a, every course indicates when it's, it's offered. So typically, the it depends how you're looking for it. If your average user is going to come in saying, what's available in the, in the fall, right, as opposed to saying, when is this available? They're coming into a course trying to see. Um, that's, that, that'll be the use cases, and, and that will determine whether that object exists. Yes, sir? Yeah, isn't the date, do you use date time as sort of a universal abstract so, object? Sure. So the question was, what about date and time? Um, date and time are great objects. Uh, because you encapsulate, because again, it's like schedule. It's like, what do you want from a date and time? What do you want it to print out, right? Guess what? Um, today is, um, okay, no, it's not, not going to work today. But typically, you see 411, right? And we go, that's April 11th, and every European says that's November 4th. So if, if you, it, because they do it differently, so you'd like your object to print itself out internationally, right? You'd also like an object to say, how many days between yourself and this other date object? There's all kinds of things you could want. So you're going to go down and you're going to you encapsulate all of that and you now make the calls and you only have to do that once and it's in an object library and it, 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 it carries over from application to application. Name is another good example of, you know, last name, first name, what about middle initial, you know, and we got to change the name object because now gender can change, you know, things that you hadn't expected. The point is you've encapsulated it and there's only one place where you have to deal, deal with it. So you've got your basic abstractions and, you know, you've, you've defined them. You, you now kind of know, hey, they're n, uh, n to 1 or 1 to n or 1 to 1. Now you want to flush it out. So what you're saying really is what are the specific elements that comprise a given object of this class and are not found in any other class? And, and this is key object-oriented analysis stuff, right? You, you have a client which connects in some way to an object, an object service, client and service. The, the connection can be, and by the way, oh, there it is, it's just kind of hibernating. Um, the connection can be anything from um, across the net to calling into an object library to whatever. The interface, again, if you're, if you're in C++ coder or even if you're not, objects tend to be divided into two things. One, well, three things. One is what attributes, what physical elements do they manipulate. The second is the code to do the manipulation. And the third is the interface, the public methods that you can call. And the goal of an object is to encapsulate the implementation, which is the data and the code, behind the interface. So you're going to be defining, for every object that we looked at, the set of public methods that other objects can call to, to change, you know, to, to, to affect and use the data that's in that object. Um, encapsulation, because all of this, the implementation is encapsulated, hidden, behind the interface, which means you can change the data in the code 
And as long as you don't change the interface, nobody else breaks. One of the, the design goals of object-oriented design is you know, uh, uh, robustness, extensibility in the face of change. Very easy to do that. One of the goals is not performance. Dirty little secret, right? If you, because you're going to be calling methods instead of going to get the data directly. And that means if, you're, if your system's running too slow, you know, wait six months, there'll be a faster computer. If your system can't be extended, that's the thing we're trying to fix. There was a question. Yes? So this, this is, we're going to look, we're going to look, if we get, how, how much time we've got. Um, we're going to get to the point where we're going to look at how this actually fits into a three-tier and a four-tier architecture. And user interfaces are not what this is. Okay, the, 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 the application, I'll talk to it in a minute, but the applications that we're talking about, the pieces that are being designed like this, it's for when you say, do it. Right? It's, when you, it's not to say I'm browsing all of the sections that are offered or the, for that quarter, for example, and I'm, I'm, you know, and I'm looking and I'm getting reviews you know, of, of yeah, I've gone to rate my prof and my review is up there, whatever. You know, and now I've made the decision. Now I'm going to say enroll or buy it or book that ticket. And all, far away from the user interfaces, which are external to what we're doing, this is the back-end stuff that's going to make the world work. So that, that's, and we'll see examples of, of, of that. Uh, uh, yes? Wouldn't something like performance be an NFR? An NFR? Non-functional requirement. Oh, oh. Um, well, <laughs> if the performance is too slow, then it doesn't function, right? No, but I mean, you know, not, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's important people worry about performance. You, the programmers mostly worry about performance. But when you're doing a design, that's not your primary concern. Your primary concern is usually encapsulating things so that change doesn't knock everything, everything over. And here's an example, right? Um, you know, you, you've got some, uh, in, in a student record, you've got the cumulative average, right? It's one of the variables inside the object. And uh, now, if everybody could see that and go at it directly, if you then decided, no, I'm going to calculate it, you're going to break everybody who ever thought that cumulative average was an element in the structure of a student. Whereas if you encapsulated it with get cum, right, which is an, a function you call to get the, the cumulative average, you could decide, I don't want to store it here, I'm going to calculate it, and you totally change the, the code and remove the object, uh, the, uh, the attribute from the, the object, and nobody else sees the change because they only ever were calling the function to get it and the function has now changed the way it's going to get it, but it still has the same interface. So all of the clients never, never see the change. That's one of the advantages of encapsulation. So having said that, we're sitting looking at one of the objects that we've talked about. Now we're, it, we, we've stopped staring at the ceiling, right? Now we're coming in and we're saying, okay, we've got this room. We've defined this room. What exactly is a room? What are some of the attributes of a room? Sorry? Size, absolutely, size. Capacity, well, capacity would be size, right. The location, right, because you're wandering around. You, so it has a location, it has a size. It has equipment, absolutely, right. And it, it has some other stuff. It has a schedule. This is great. You take my course. Um, <laughs> all right, anything else? All right, so let's look, right. Um, so this is room attributes. Uh, it's got a schedule, it's got a location, uh, it, it's, it's got an owning department, a capacity, it has equipment list where equipment is, there's an enumerated type of all the equipment that we have and an amount. Uh, it doesn't show a couple of things. Uh, and again, this isn't directly this talk, but if you're looking at an object you're, uh, you, and you're saying, I'm looking at an object, there should be three things you should be looking for. They're not always present, but you've got to consider them, and it's every object you ever have. One is the unique ID. What's the unique ID of this thing? If it doesn't have a unique ID, I got to start thinking of it's an object. And it turns out there's one object we looked at that doesn't, that's seat. Seat doesn't have a unique ID, but it, it joins. So this, the ID of the seat is the student in that section. But there's still an ID there, 
right? If, you, if your object doesn't have a unique ID, then it's not an object. Second is... Uh, uh, there's no number of seats? There's no... The capacity. Okay. The, the, yeah. I'm curious if you didn't use the word seat. Oh, uh, in the room? No, I wouldn't want to use... A room doesn't really have... The seats are tied to the section. A room, yeah, that's true. How could a room not have seats? You, everybody's sitting on the floor? No, the, but the seat abstraction is the thing that we call that ties you, so it's a virtual seat, and you're, you're, as opposed to sitting on the virtual floor. Yes, there, there is. You're trying to, you, right, you wouldn't, you wouldn't say a room has seats, it has a capacity. Thank you, you're absolutely correct. Um, the other thing is, so one is, uh, uh, does it have a unique ID? The second one is, does it have types? So, for example, on room, there could be a lab, there could be a lecture room, there could be, there would be different types. And whenever you get into types, that's the key to say, oh God, do I have to subclass this? Right, because it has different kinds of types and there's ways, and I not enough time to get into, design criteria for deciding when you should subclass it. And one of the obvious ones is, does it, can it shift back and forth? Uh, you know, a part-time teacher, can you become a full-time teacher, then don't subclass them. But the, but the, so that's the second one, and the third one is state. Does this object have state? Room typically doesn't, um, but uh, a student certainly does, enrolled or not, or a, a section certainly does, uh, waitlisted and so on. So those are the three things, type, state, and ID. And, and when you look at creating objects, those are some cool things to start thinking about uh, uh, in your objects that you define. So we've um, kind of uh, come from here, we've said, okay, object-oriented uh, uh, abstraction classification. We've looked at a conceptual class diagram, which is the high-level thing. It's an UML artifact. And we've looked at a class list, which is, again, the thing we were just looking at for a room. It says, take one of these abstractions and figure out all the stuff that has to be in there. And now, you, at, at this point, you've kind of, oh, you've identified the basic set of stuff, and you're now filling in, you're getting a better idea about what these abstractions are. Now, the next step, which we're not going to go to, uh, is, is event state diagrams, where you start des describing the behavior, and then again, when use cases come in, like enroll student in section, you, you have to then map to the objects with the attributes and the interfaces and the behaviors that you've defined, how those objects handle each of the use cases, and that gets you into sequence flows. Uh, whoa, okay. I don't need this anymore, um, because I'm gonna point. Is that on tape? Great. Okay, so, um, so let's, let's take a look at how do you implement this stuff, because everything we've been talking about um, uh, has been kind of staring at the ceiling and thinking, right? If we can't implement it, uh, then it's like a house that we've designed that we forgot the foundation. So this is in one slide, uh, right up through the 90s. Okay, I'm, I, you could add uh, Python, you could add Java and a whole bunch of languages to it, and they had reasons. But the evolution of the 20-year frame was all driven by object-oriented requirements. If you think about it, in, you know, the, the, the basic basic, right, which was the thing that, you know, Bill Gates is now a very, very rich man, uh, was um, you had a basic program, it had line numbers in it, God help us, and uh, you, would, you would write, um, this is where I usually use a board, uh, you would write go sub 600, and in, the, in, the, in the, the code at line 600 would be a bunch of code, and then you would say return. This is considered a major step forward advantage from go to, right, where you just go to back and forth. And it, but the idea was to take a chunk of code and reuse it. That was the original vision. That chunk of code was at 600. But worse than that, you could always renumber that, you know, but what you couldn't do was change the variables. And the reason was that every variable in basic was global. So if you changed a dollar sign, any other application or any other sub-program in that application just had a dollar sign creamed. It meant that you would have to, when you try to resell your GoSub, whatever the name of it was, 
um, to anybody else, you'd have to say, oh, and by the way, here are the variables you can't use, which was ludicrous. Um, and so Fortran came along, and Fortran said, okay, you know, we can fix this, and they did. Subroutines had a name. That was cool. But more importantly, subroutines had variables that were relative to the subroutine. So if you, in a subroutine, use the variable a3, excuse me, if you use a variable A3, anybody else using A3 was not going to get hurt because that variable only had scope, was only defined inside the subroutine that you, that you defined. So it meant that I could legitimately write, for the very first time, subroutines, and I could give them a name, and I could sell them, or put them in a, in a library, and people could reuse them. It was the ability to cut a project into chunks and do some of those and deliver it, have separate people delivering it, and then reuse it on other projects. Okay, and, and that, that was the beginning of subroutine libraries, and that was cool. What you were doing was you were encapsulating the details of how you did it, and you just had the arguments that were in the call. So you, it was, the implementation was hidden, and the interface was the, whatever arguments you used and whatever was going to be done to those arguments. And that was the, the state of things till C came along. And uh, it was genius. The moment I saw that, how many people have programmed in C? Oh yeah, just great. So you're going to understand what I'm about to say next. I, I saw this, I'd been programming in assembly language, and, they, and I found out what malloc was. They said, if you want more memory, you ask malloc. And I went, right. And I figured malloc was this ancient Semitic god Oh, Malik, please grant me, because, because it was magic. It was magic, right? The, the, it was ingenious, okay? But, but more than that, and more than the register variable, which meant I could actually put into a machine register something in a high-level language, was the struct. And the struct was awesome, because the struct said, you have a teacher. What are the components of that? And you could say, well, a teacher has an ID, has a, a salary. Now, in, in a better world, that salary would require a double precision, but it has a salary. Well, that would be an alternative universe in addition to... Um, and it has, um, you know, and you could define the abstraction in the language. Before that, you couldn't do it. You had the, the variables you had, you know, were, you have to combine them into these overlapped unions. It was disgusting. You, know, you couldn't represent what a student was. Suddenly, with C, the good news was you could say, here is what this student is. And you can point to it. You can have an array of them. You can have arrays of pointers to them. They're like any other variable. Well, actually, no, they're not. The reason that they're not like any other variable uh, is because you can't operate on them directly. Um, there's a thing called polymorphism, which um, I, I heard first time uh, years and years ago there was an object-oriented conference when object-oriented was as hot as machine language is today. And by the way, thank you for being here. The words machine language is not in this talk, and yet we still fill the room. I'm just, I'm just so pleased. But they had a parrot there, and the parrot was, it, it could say the words. It was going, inheritance, brock, polymorphism, brock. And then the guy said, we're not just parroting these words, we understand. Anyway, the point is that, that polymorphism says a very important rule if you're an object-oriented developer, which is, Every operation takes on meaning. Every operation takes on meaning from the things that it's operating on. And like plus, you add two numbers, right? But it has a very different thing if what you're adding are two integers or two floats. Very different things happen. Conceptually, it's plus, right? So what, what you start realizing is, well, adding a student to a section is telling the section, please add this student, right? And it would be good, and, and you're going to be using the internals of both a section and maybe a student to do that, but then if any of those details change, everything breaks, wouldn't it be cool to have all of the data inside of a struct private to the set of operations that use it? And that's what an object is, basically. The, all of the data in the struct is now private, and all of the, the, the methods that use it are now the public methods of that uh, operation, and can see uh, uh, the, it always is, right, 
you know, yes, the public methods are the only things that can see the private parts of the object, right? So, and it's shielded, and the compiler will protect you against that. So what you had in all, in all these cases was it was heading toward objects, right? First, you could cut off a piece of code and return without knowing who called you. Then you had a name and arguments that were your own. Then you had data that represented the abstractions you were thinking of. And finally, you had objects that combined the two to say all of the good things we got about um, uh, uh, subroutines, uh, we're now going to put all of the subroutines that had to do with this data together, and we're going to wrap it, and we're going to call it an object, and you're going to manipulate those. And, and so the languages were heading toward supporting the things that an architect data, uh, and a data uh, and a systems uh, software architect, excuse me, uh, needed in the language. It provided the foundation for the house. So um, uh, this is a typical use case. Once you have your objects and once you have your performance defined and so on, uh, this um, uh, uh, how, question, how are we doing for time? We still have, are we almost out or five minutes? Okay, moving through. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Just give us the history. Yeah, here's a, here, no, well, I got, no, there's a little bit more. I, I, was, I was winging it. Um, so the, um, the, this is a typical use case, but this isn't really the, as critical to what I wanted to say. This is what I wanted to say. Where is this stuff working, right? So you've got a three-tier architecture, and your users are out here, and they're going into a, a web service, and typically there are servlets. And how many people know what servlets are? Okay, less, but still good. Uh, it's threads and it operates in a web service. And so out here, you're gathering things like user ID and password, that set up a session. And then you're going to say, oh, by the way, you're going to, one of your applications, you're going to be sitting at your terminal or, or your registrar desk or tablet. You're going to go, uh, register me in sections, you know, CS2807. Um, and that's going to come across the internet and it's going to be validated here. In, in tier, in t this is tier one, this is tier two. And what could be bringing this over is JavaScript, Ruby on Rails, whatever. Over here, for the most part, you're now, you, and, and so that, that will then put a stack of things to do. There's a thread sucking that off and shooting it out to tier three, which is the application service. Um, what comes across, this is typically REST and JSON for, between the tiers, between the web service and the app service. Um, and uh, they had the author of Jason speaking yesterday, which was cool. Um, and then uh, what you get in is basically enroll student ID in section. So the, these are strings. That's all that comes over. That's your command. That's your use case. Enroll that student in that section. The client is the main line of the program. This is an application service, and that's the thing that's, that people, a lot of people don't see. The client receives the commands coming in from the web service, the requests coming in. Each request is a use case. It's a thing that, and there's maybe 30 of them for this particular application. Um, oh yeah, here we go, use cases. Uh, assign teacher to section, assign room. Those are commands coming into our application. The client is the main line. And to, to do enrolled student in section, what the client says is, it asks the college, get me the student object given the ID is one, two, three, four. Then it says to the college, get me the section whose ID is CS2873. It's got both objects. And then it says to the section, enroll that student. The client is the ones making commands on the object library. The thing to understand is that the object library, unlike a regular object library like date, where you say, what's the date? Here's the date. Here you say, enroll student in section. And it looks like a pinball game, objects calling, objects calling, objects to, to, to do that enrollment because you're doing all the things in the use case. Are the schedules okay? Is the student paid up? Um, you know, it, uh, uh, is the student qual to have all the prereqs? All of that's being happened because we've understood and we've designed the objects to handle methods. And most of those methods are being called by other objects. And eventually what comes back is yes or no. Okay. But so that's, and now the question is, this is one application in an application service in an enterprise with many, many applications. How do we connect it in to the other applications in an enterprise environment? There's only a couple of more slides here. So 
you think about the things that we draw on in student enrollment, um, you know, there's a, here are some of the applications. There's a ton of applications, even in a simple college, right? There's a student information system. There's a student portal. There's a thing that schedules classes. There's a facility management system that takes care of the rooms. Um, um, you know, there's an employee management system that has things about the teachers. Uh, all of this, we're going to be drawing on this. Uh, how do we get all the information that we need about a student? We have a student's ID. So we can go and get the information we need about the student because somehow we're linked into these systems. And there's two ways to do that. Uh, one is through a message broker, which involves middleware, where we make a request and the message broker figures out where it goes. This is an architecture where each application has its own data. And the only way you can get at it is through requesting it. And so we are basically sitting in an environment on an application server where we are calling the message broker to call other application servers giving them the, the requests. The one thing you know if you're an application server is the request wouldn't have gotten to you if it wasn't valid. So it solves a lot of the security issues that you might otherwise see. And also, we have things like, the things that we maintain are the schedules and who's in a room. So the sections in a room and so on. And there's an emergency contact system that says, you know, um, an arm shooter in school, who's in that room? And they want, they're going to use our stuff our schedule, because they know that room has a schedule, it's this section, okay, who's enrolled in that section, they get data from us. All of these things play together. And this is the other way to do it. Um, you have a common database in tier four, and your applications make, it's easy to make SQL requests to get the data, it's not so easy to tell the database I'm updating these fields, but, um, so, but, but this is a second alternative. Uh, to, to um, um, you know, if you enrolled in a section, you're changing data in multiple places. Uh, you know, like you're, you're, you're being billed for it, your schedule is changing, the section seat is filled. All of those are changes that are occurring and have to be reflected in the database, and they can be reflected by the individual objects that own those databases, or they can be reflected by you going into the database system. So, um, whoops. Yeah, one second. So, how to become a software developer. Um, there's exactly two more slides, this one and the next one, which is a Lollapalooza. So the, the software developer, you might start with getting OOP programming skills, learning about design patterns, and then everything, a, a software architect is by definition in one domain. If you're, it, you need the adjective, you are a retail software architect, you are a travel industry software architect, because you're architecting in a space of applications. What I just showed you was something that an educational software architect would live and breathe, but other, other industries wouldn't know. And so, you know, you're, you, are, you're, you, are, you know how to design houses or you know how to design bridges, but the two don't necessarily carry over. Um, I wanted to show you, I'm hoping this is the next slide. It is. So here, is the model for retail. If you are a retail architect, you live and breathe this stuff. Um, and, and you can, this is where I wanted the, the light pen, of course, but what the hell. You look at this and you go, what is this? These are the systems and the data stores for the things that are in retail. And an architect knows this and knows how to fit stuff in. So here's, you can look at this thing with a hundred things coming out of it. That's point of sale. All God's children want to know what happened at the point of sale. All the systems want to know because you're going to decrement inventory. You're going to reward the clerk who's really moving sales through if it's, at a, if it's in a store. You're going to want to deal with coupons. You're going to want to deal with loyalty cards and discounts. You're going to want to deal with, you know, again, invent, keeping track of inventory, price optimization. We've detected that it's raining outside, so let's increase the price of umbrellas. Or, yeah, hey, that just did it by itself. <laughs> That must be my time has run out. But, I, but, but that last slide was supposed to convey the fact that everything we're talking about, uh, working your way up to software architect, it happens inside of an industry. And you become, an, in, and your career path is in that industry. So, you know, you, you better pick one. And they're different. They are very different. Um, uh, and the 30 seconds left, I'm, I'm going to do this. Um, because it's interesting, you know, uh, 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 like retail, 
is is just kind of a, a, basically a bunch a bunch. A bunch of white guys smoking cigars, okay? E education and healthcare are very different. You've got people in those industries who care and want to make a difference. And they also have one thing that other industries don't have. The end users cooperate. Um, if you're in insurance or you're in travel or so on and you find a good solution, you don't tell anyone. Whereas in education and uh, healthcare, you're up on the stage talking about it. So it's a, it's a you know, again, it's a good one to do. Um, uh, you know, and, and uh, the... How do you, in, uh, the other one, how do you, uh, how do you uh, uh, tell if you're, you're talking to an extroverted uh, uh, um, research scientist? And the answer is he, he looks at your shoes when he's talking to you instead of his own. <laughs> point is, you can find out a lot. Different, different industries attract different types. So the last point is, if you're looking to become a software architect, pick your industry and then start working your way up. And that's, that's how it's done. Thank you very much. <laughs>